portable gaming for the longest time was always considered different from just, well, normal gaming. It always came down to the hardware, so when it comes to playing a game on handheld, you always expected for it to be different. But lately, that's been changing. With the introduction of the Switch in 2017, a lot of developers just stopped making versions for their games on the 3DS. Why would they need to? When the Switch can run a console game and it's portable, it kind of makes the 3DS pointless. And now with the Steam Deck releasing, we are truly getting closer and closer to a world where handheld gaming isn't going to be its own thing anymore. Where did I first notice this change? In the LEGO video games. Ever since LEGO Star Wars 2, the Nintendo DS and 3DS have been getting LEGO games made for it that would release the same day as the console version. These versions would always end up completely different from their console counterparts. In my previous videos about these games, you can see that I have quite a weird relationship with them. So today, I'm going to play and review these six games. The last six LEGO games made for the 3DS and developed by TT Fusion. Also, at the end of the video, I will rank every single LEGO handheld game. So stay tuned for that. Anyways, let's go see how the LEGO handheld game saga will come to an end. LEGO Ninjago Nindroids is a 3DS and PS Vita exclusive. But the interesting thing about this game is that it wasn't developed by TT Fusion, instead being developed by Hellbent Games. This is not their first time making LEGO games though. They developed the real-time strategy games, LEGO Battles, and LEGO Ninjago Battles, and developed the LEGO Friends game as well. I have never played LEGO Battles or LEGO Friends, so I honestly have no idea what to expect for this game. Although I did play it as a kid, I can hardly remember anything about it. Which is weird because I was a huge fan of Ninjago as a kid, so there must be some reason why I can hardly remember playing this game. Let's take a look. Starting up the game, we are greeted to this opening cinematic. It's a pretty cool way to show who developed and published the games. But after that is over, we see the all too familiar cheap looking start screen. Obviously, I don't expect something grand or amazing, but come on. This just looks so low effort. Like if I take away the top screen, it would be impossible to know what kind of game this is going to be. Obviously, I'm looking way too into this. So let's just play the game. When the game starts loading, I can already see the infamous time attack and multi-challenge gold bricks. So I'm guessing after removing them from LEGO The Hobbit, they thought it was a good idea to bring them back. Great. Something interesting though, is all the cutscenes are ripped right from the show, but they took the time to completely redub all of the characters, change a lot of the sound effects, and change the soundtrack to something way more generic. Like, I understand that hiring the original voice cast to do dialogue during the actual game was probably expensive, but I'm sure the original cast probably had loads of old dialogue that could have been used. Like, it's not an issue that the voices are different, it's just very jarring to hear these after watching the original show. But starting the first level, it's basically just an introduction to the movement in the game. But in good news, finally you can jump again. They even kept dodging in the game. While I'm glad jumping is back, the game is still in the isometric angle, which at times can make doing platforming feel awful. It's hard to tell where you're actually going to land. They also have these ledges that you can jump on to traverse levels, but for some reason after jumping on one, your character does an animation which makes it so much slower. They haven't done this in previous LEGO games, so I'm just wondering why is it here? But other than that, this game controls pretty much exactly like every other LEGO game. The combat feels fine. There isn't nothing too special about it. Although you can do spinjitsu, which is a lot of fun watching it destroy anything you touch. But nothing really stands out. It is cool seeing the ninjas all have different fighting animations, but that also leads to another issue. Some of the characters have extremely slow fighting animations for no reason which will cause you to get hit while in battle, but also just makes the combat feel so boring. It makes me never want to play as those characters with slower animations. Normally, if a character in a video game fights slower, they at least will do more damage to accommodate for it. But no, it does the same damage. Not to mention, hitting enemies in this game just feels off. It feels like there's a slight delay between the animation of your character hitting an enemy and the enemy reacting to it. The same can be said for hitting objects as well, it just doesn't feel right. But it doesn't matter at the end of the day, because finally they added respawning back. Why did this take so long for them to add? I'm not sure, but I'm not going to complain. So while the combat and movement all feels really off in this game, I guess it's time to talk about the levels. Maybe they can be the saving grace. Yeah, no. The levels in this game are probably some of the most meh levels I've played in any LEGO game. Again, they're all in the isometric angle, making each level feel boring because you're so far away from the action. But even without that, these are some of the most bland and forgettable environments. I can hardly remember any of the settings in this game, almost every single one of them are just a lab. Occasionally you'll be outside or something different, but almost every single level looks the same. It doesn't help that most of the levels you just go from point A to point B, with nothing in your way other than enemies or minor platforming. 
occasionally there was some interesting levels like the 2d side scrolling level the mail delivery level that changes the formula of the game and also the boss fight was pretty different but other than those three levels i mentioned and if you ignore the vehicle levels which i will get to in a second the levels are all extremely bland like they don't even have puzzles or anything occasionally you'll need to switch your character because say cole is the only character who can break walls with cracks in them or kai is the only one that can melt ice but that happens so rarely and you can't really call that a puzzle it's more of a small inconvenience. Levels are also extremely short in this game with nothing to explore or find. Some levels have red bricks or a mini kit. Yes, only one mini kit, but other than that, there is nothing to go out and find. These levels were made for the sole purpose of beating them and nothing more. Despite these levels being so short, the game feels extremely slow. This is because for some reason after every little thing that happens, you have to watch an in-game cutscene. Like they over explain everything to you, which is funny because the game is so simple. After you go to a new area at a level, yep, they'll show you exactly where you need to go to progress. Like, why? Just let me play the game. It doesn't help that even when switching characters, it has this stupid transition between it. And you can only go in one direction on the character wheel, which makes it so annoying. Obviously, you can prevent that by using a touchscreen, but having to stop what I'm doing to focus on a touchscreen is annoying. Back to the gameplay itself, there will be other things levels can do that could be somewhat different like the mech sections, the boss battles, or vehicle sections. Much like everything else, the mech stuff and boss battles are very forgettable, but the vehicle sections on the other hand have some variety. Most of the time, it's a simple on-rail shooter where you're shooting at targets while the game does all the moving for you. These are pretty boring and the level is like over in a minute, but sometimes you can control the vehicles which can lead to some pretty cool levels, like the one where you're Lloyd on a bike, or the frustrating ones like the one where you had to avoid this dragon's attacks. I will say it was mostly annoying when trying to 100% the game because two of the challenges were avoid getting hit with the fireball attacks and avoid getting hit by his swooping attacks. His fireball attacks were extremely annoying, especially by the end where he would just spam them. But the swooping attacks caused so much frustration because you can never predict where they're actually going to go and they're really annoying to avoid. I hated this level so much. I hated going for 100% in this game in general. It didn't help for one, it's not explore based. Instead, it's do really mindless objectives that are copied and pasted across each level, and two, they brought the damn time challenges back. Yes, in every level, you'll be forced to run through it as fast as you can to get a gold brick. And yet again, for some reason, they brought them back in the multi-challenge as well. So after I go run through the level as fast as I can once, I'll have to go do it again instead this time doing stupid objectives like avoid taking damage for example. But it gets so much worse because after playing the level twice, now to get those gold bricks for some reason, they thought it was a good idea to get rid of switching to any character you want at any time. So you'll have some gold bricks that'll be beat the level as a certain character or as a skeleton or snake, but you can't read the damn challenge requirements until you're already in the level. And the same objectives can sometimes be thrown into the multi-challenge as well. This caused so much frustration. There would be so many times I would start a level and choose a random character because I had no clue which one would require a challenge and then instantly have to leave that level because I have none of the characters that are required for that certain challenge. So when it comes to these boring levels, you'll be playing them a lot. And I mean more than I had to for LEGO Marvel Super Heroes. Also, sometimes certain characters will be needed to get a red brick or mini kit. Like I remember before in the early LEGO games like LEGO Batman and the Complete Saga, you didn't get to choose any character you want, but they at least made sure you had every character so you could 100% that level. I just don't understand why they would remove this feature, especially because in so many of the levels, you need loads of different characters. I am so tired of these objectives. I miss when you had to go and explore or try new things to find mini kits in the levels. These objectives aren't fun. Like, oh boy, I can't wait to avoid breaking any street lights in this level or to break 44 objects in this one. Something that really annoyed me is sometimes the multi-challenge wouldn't even reward you for a character like it normally does. It would instead just give you a couple of studs. Like, come on, could you not have thought of any other characters to add to this game? But wait a second, it doesn't even make any more sense because so many characters are unlocked via cheat codes. So doing this is just dumb. Another stupid thing is you can only have three red bricks on at once again for some reason, despite them getting rid of it in the last game. They just need to make up their mind on what they want to do or don't want to do in these games. I did not want to start this video in such a negative way, but it frustrates me that this game brought back so many of the frustrating things found in LEGO Marvel Super Heroes that were previously removed from games after that. Is there anything possibly good I could say about this game? Well, I'm happy to say they finally brought back the hub worlds. This one is Ninjago City. It is pretty small and there isn't much to do in it. It's pretty cool and you can find tons of characters walking around doing tons of random stuff. 
but it's just here to access the levels in the shop. They also have this new dojo mode where you just fight a certain number of enemies. I'm not sure if it's required for 100% completion, but I completed it anyways. There isn't much to it and it wasn't hard or anything, just wasted a lot of time. I also like the characters in this game. Being able to play as the ninjas in some of their past suits is pretty cool, but other than that, this game is just such a weird release to me. Like, it's extremely boring for one, and they brought back so many of the things that made LEGO Marvel Super Heroes so awful, despite getting rid of a lot of them in the last game. Like, it's confusing as hell on why something like this even happened. Also, I forgot to mention, but the 100% reward is a dragon in the hub world. At first, it was attacking me, but after that, it only attacked enemies. At least it's something, normally these games don't even have anything at all. This is a fine game and all, but even the story mode is annoying to get through because how boring it is. I don't really recommend it to anyone, even if you're a Ninjago fan, and I think I know why I could not remember what I thought about this game back in the day, because the game is just so boring. Like, even if LEGO Marvel Super Heroes, I can talk about how bad it does everything, but this game is just so damn forgettable. Also, for those people wondering why I included this game on my list and not LEGO Friends or LEGO Battles, despite them being developed by Hellbit Games as well, it's because this game is most similar to an actual LEGO game. I will cover those games, and I plan to do it very soon, but they are very different from traditional LEGO games. So yeah, I didn't like this game. But this game kind of had a spin-off made from it. It was called LEGO Ninjago Tournament, and it released on the App Store a couple of months after the 3DS game. I have tons of memories playing this game as a kid, but sadly, like most old App Store games, you cannot play it anymore. But I will still briefly talk about it. This game is combat based. There are no levels. Instead, you fight an endless horde of enemies in a battle arena. There will be the occasional boss fight as well. You can buy all the usual extras and whatnot, but this game has so many new characters not found in the 3DS game. Your characters will even level up as you play, which gives them more weapons. I remember this game being very addicting and it has a pretty small fan base. I'd love to be able to play it again, but since I can't play it, I don't really have that much to say about it. So I think it's time to move on to the next game. LEGO Batman 3 Beyond Gotham is the third LEGO Batman game, and yeah, I was not a fan of the console version of this game growing up. I haven't played it in ages, so I'm not sure how well it'll hold up now, but I hated what they did with the hub worlds in that game, and I find the levels to be pretty boring. But I actually didn't play this game on a 3DS when it came out. Instead, I played the iOS version when it released, and I do remember enjoying it quite a bit, and I got 100% a couple of times. I could still download the game today on my iPhone, which is crazy. You can even see all my old achievements from back in the day. But today, I'm going to play the 3DS version, so let's find out. Does the game still hold up? Hey, when starting the game, it looks like they're finally ditching those awful looking menu designs, which I'm very happy about. As soon as I press new game, I'm instantly brought to the first level. While the level loads, I can read what challenges I can do to unlock old bricks. But going straight into the gameplay, we are finally brought back to the more traditional LEGO game levels. We got the more up close camera, no dodge button, and even some more exploring based level designs. The game looks and feels great, although it doesn't feel like everything transitions smoothly back to the older LEGO game format. You see, whenever you want to build something or interact with anything in the game, you can't do it in any area you want. You have to do it in a specific area. If you try to do it outside of that area, your character will automatically move to it and then start doing that action, which just feels very weird. Like, it made sense in the asymmetric style LEGO games since you're so far away from the character and most of the action, but it feels so out of place here. It's not something that ruins the game for me at all, far from it, it just doesn't feel right. Anyways, continuing with the levels, the levels in this game are pretty fun, though each level is split up into three parts, which is pretty annoying. Again, it makes sense for the previous format they are going for, but it doesn't feel the best here. Like, the levels did not need to be split up at all. They could have easily just continued it and make it one big level, which I definitely would have preferred. The levels are all just a retelling of the console versions. Things are different, but they go through the same environments and locations. I absolutely love the settings for a lot of these levels. The whole first level takes place in the underground sewers and acts as a great introduction to the game. You have the mini Europe level where you go through areas in Europe in small form, and it's so cool. There's also this whole level where you have to go through Joker's amusement park, and yeah, that level was super cool as well. My only issue with most of these levels in the game is it feels like they're over way too soon. Sometimes this isn't an issue with the first level for example, but you'll always be in the sewers throughout that level. But with the Europe level, the first section is in Paris, and after the quick section, now you're in London within a couple of minutes. I would have loved to see these levels be a lot longer because they're so much fun. Just simple puzzles with the occasional boss fight or enemies in your way. 
and that's something I've wished for them to return to for ages now. They even have great level settings, but I feel like as soon as I start the level, I'm pulled right out of it. The boss fights are pretty cool as well. Sure, most of them are just dodge attacks and then beat them up, but they had this cool one where you play rock, paper, scissors with Sinetro, and I really enjoyed it. The levels will occasionally switch things up with vehicle and flying sections. There isn't many of them in the game, but these just aren't fun. For one, they're very annoying to come back to in 100%, and two, they're just auto-scores and feel way too mindless. You just move around the screen and shoot, but you can't change how fast you want to go, so the level will basically just be the same every single time you play it. The levels in the game are pretty fun, just way too short, but getting 100% in them isn't bad either because most of the missions are explorer based. On each section of a level, you'll have 5 gold bricks to unlock, so 15 gold bricks per level. Two of them will always be unlocked for completing the level and getting true hero. The other objectives will always be find a hidden joker card, or break certain objects like Batman or Joker objects for example, find the red brick, or jump slam 3 enemies in a level. Most of the objectives have you exploring the levels with these new characters and such, and it's a lot of fun. But these are also very short and easy as well, and I would much rather have to find 10 mini kits, but hey, I'm glad there isn't a time Time travel in there. So yes, the levels are really good in this game. My main complaint just being I wish they were longer and had more collectibles. But in between levels, you'll walk through the hub worlds. Yes, there are two of them in this game. The Watchtower and the Batcave. And it's cool watching them play into the story mode, like having to build a rocket ship or finding stuff to travel to the lantern planets. Not only that, but both of them have collectibles that you can find by exploring, which is super cool. Both of these hub worlds are unique from each other, and it's a very welcome addition. I honestly prefer these to the hub worlds they gave us in the console version, just because I feel like the hub worlds in the console version were way too big and confusing. But now, I think it's finally time to talk about the characters. So like LEGO Batman 2, you have tons of superiors to play as, with lots of them all having their own abilities. Fight and Super Speed finally make a return. They haven't been in a LEGO portable game since LEGO Batman 2. Flying feels so much better in this game. Now being able to fly up and down and have complete freedom on where to go. It's so useful for navigating levels in the hub worlds. Speedsters mostly stay the same, just this time you don't need to hold down the button to use super speed. For some reason you can also no longer run in water, which is weird. Some characters like Batman can glide, or like Robin can do athletic stuff and double jump. There's quite a bit of variety when it comes to the movement, which makes a lot of the characters feel unique from each other and gives you a lot of options when traversing levels or the hub worlds. Combat in this game feels amazing. It's super fast and looks great. Most characters have their own unique fighting animations which is so cool. You can also use lasers or other attacks on enemies as well, but one of my favorite additions to the combat has to be countering. It's kind of similar to how it's done in the Arkham games. You'll see a button prompt, and when an enemy is about to attack, if you press it at the right time, you'll do a counter. It makes the combat flow so nicely and keeps things moving. Like LEGO Batman 1 and 2, this game also has suits for Batman and Robin, but this time it's switching it up. Now you can switch to any suit anytime you want, and Batman and Robin aren't the only ones that have multiple suits. Joker, Cyborg, and Lex Luthor do as well. I think this ability should be exclusive to Batman and Robin, because it kinda makes playing as them almost pointless. Also, I think a lot of these suits are just lame, like Batman's spacesuit for example. It lets him fly if he has fuel, and lets him laser gold objects. So many characters can already do that without having to worry about jet fuel, so why would I ever want to play as him? Robin has some lame suits as well, like the light suit and dive suit. The light suit gives you the ability to light up dark areas, and the dive suit, well, let you go underwater, but I'm happy to see his hazard suit have the suction ability from LEGO Batman 1, because these things were so satisfying to collect. Also, his techno suit lets him do this panel mini game, but I only bring this up because the panel mini game just reminds me of a mobile phone game, but overall, the suit mechanic is fine. I definitely prefer the old one, just because Batman and Robin having so many suits that are just abilities that better characters can do feels pointless, and seeing Joker in an inflatable suit is something I shouldn't have to see. Before I stop talking about the characters though, I will say I love how all of them have their own unique idle animations, just the little details that add so much. This game is filled with so many little details that I just adore, like the announcements that'll just randomly play while in the watchtower, the callbacks to LEGO Batman 2's story, Hey, this place is still damaged from the last time we fought the Joker. Or how some characters have different face expressions depending on what they're doing. Also, I don't remember the character roster in this game being this small. It's not a bad character roster, but I definitely remember there being more characters in this game. And this is when I figured out, the iOS version of this game got tons of free DLC, like the Batman Beyond characters, more 1960s characters, Arrowverse characters, and Dark Knight characters. This is so cool, it just sucks, why didn't the 3DS and Vita get these? So the 3DS and Vita version did get an update later down the line, they got some free characters, but only two of them, 
Plastic Man and Zer in R Batman. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but at least they gave us something. I'm just confused on why they didn't update those versions. But anyways, I don't have anything left to really say about this game. Overall, I just think it's okay. It is definitely way better than the isometric games we've been getting, but it's still having a hard time recovering from that. It is a big improvement from the previous games, and honestly, I had a great time. The game is super quick to 100%. So if you ever want to play a new LEGO Batman game, then maybe give this one a shot. But it is time to move on. Lego Ninjago Shadow of Ronin is a game I've never actually played before. It released exclusively for the 3DS and PS Vita and would later release on iOS and Android. This game has a small fan base and I've heard a lot of good things about it. I honestly have no clue what to expect, so I'm going to get right into things. To start it off, this game has its own 3D animated cutscenes. It's pretty cool. They even recreated the intro for the show using the same animation they used for the cutscenes. All the cutscenes are quite charming, honestly. As long as you ignore how almost everyone is recasted, these feel like you're just watching an episode from the show, and I love it. Although for some reason the actors can never say Nia's name right, they constantly just say Naya, and it throws me off every single time I hear it. Now it's all back! Naya, I've got my memories back! That's great, Jay! Yet again, this game plays nothing like the isometric ones, and thank god for that. I had a blast with this game. When it came out, it was right around when I stopped watching Ninjago, so all the references and characters were recognizable to me. Growing up, I wanted the LEGO Ninjago game so bad, and now I feel really bad for skipping out on this one. It feels like I'm playing through 3 or 4 episodes of the show. The gameplay is mostly the same as every other LEGO game, the only unique thing that changes things up a bit is Spinjitsu, which it's mostly used for combat, but it is used in some of the puzzles as well. And it's great for sucking up studs and smashing everything. The levels in this game are actually long. Even if they're split up into 3 parts, like LEGO Batman 3, each part is long by itself, and most of the time brings you to a new location. Most of the levels will challenge you with platforming and puzzle solving, which is a lot of fun. You'll always be switching through a big party of characters that all have different abilities, and there are a lot of puzzles you have to solve with your CPU partner. But other than that, it's some pretty basic puzzle solving. This game does have a lot of platforming as well, which can be pretty fun, but there isn't really anything new thrown into the mix. The settings for the levels are pretty cool. Most of them are just throwbacks to the show, but you'll be going through a lot of jungles, temples, and even a volcano at one point. I think my favorite level has to be the one where you're switching between two universes. It has a lot of puzzles using that mechanic, and it was so fun. Some levels will just be a boss fight, and these boss fights are really well done here. In most of them, the camera angle is more closer to you and moves with you, which can make things more intense. But it also makes it easier to pay attention to moving objects. During some boss fights, Serena will even fall apart while battling in it, but most of these all kind of blend in with each other. Other than the traditional levels and boss fights, the only other type of level you'll be playing are vehicle ones. Again, these are just okay. They're just auto score sections and super easy. They're not awful when at least they give you multiple vehicles like jets, cars, mechs, and sometimes a dragon, but they are just kind of boring. Getting 100% in levels is the same as LEGO Batman 3. But instead of having to smash a certain amount of objects, you're given stuff that are unique to the level you're playing. Like avoid all the traps in a level, or defeat a certain number of enemies using a certain character. All levels have character tokens to find in them, but only some levels have red bricks in them. Get ready for this though. If you've ever played LEGO Indiana Jones 2, you would know they have this very weird 3 times stud multiplier. You know, in almost every single LEGO game, they're in even numbers and only go up to 10. Well, this game decided to 1-up LEGO Indiana Jones 2 and have a 5 times stud multiplier. So that means we have numbers 2 through 6 as score multipliers in LEGO games. It's so crazy crazy seeing this in the game. Hopefully one day it'll give us the one time stud multiplier, something we've always really wanted. Just think about how useful that would be. Anyways, back to the game. The levels were really easy to 100%, and that's okay. I had a really fun time during the story mode, and even during free play as well. That's mostly thanks to the characters. The character roster in this game is great, there's so many callbacks to the show. One of my favorite parts is with the four main ninja, depending on which suit you are in, they'll have a different weapon according to the one they had in the show. Like how in their ZX armor they have their golden weapons, or in their techno suits they have their techno weapons. It's such a nice detail that goes a long way. All their fighting animations are different from each other as well, and it reminds me of their personalities from the show. Other than the four main ninja, you get so many cool characters from the show like Pink Zane, Darif, and Four-Armed Garmadon. Yes, he fights with all four of the golden weapons. The amount of unique characters in this game is great, and I genuinely would have loved this game as a kid. It makes me feel like the developers of this game had a lot of knowledge of the show, or were even fans of it themselves. But the characters are so much fun in this game thanks to the combat. 
The combat feels so smooth and nice. It's extremely fast paced and fun. All the main ninja fight different from each other. They all have different weapons and combos. You can use your elemental powers in combat as well, like throwing boulders with coal or freezing enemies with Zane. Every character after finishing a combo will sometimes do a finisher, and some of these are unique to a certain character. But one of my favorite ways to combat enemies has to be Spinjitsu. The only way you can use Spinjitsu is by doing combos, which will charge it up. But when you can eventually use it, you'll suck up enemies, studs, and just destroy everything in your path. It's so much fun to use and feels overpowered like it should. So the game great combat and levels. Is there anything negative I have to say about this game? Well, there are some things I wasn't a big fan of. Like the game playing an in-game cutscene every 5 minutes, these weird building mini games, and the hub world. Yeah, the hub world in this game really sucks. For starters, you have to watch the same animation of Kai getting on his dragon every single time you want to go back to it. You control a dragon and have to fly your way to every level, which is pretty annoying. You access the shop and everything else by simply pausing the game. But come on, you could have just had a basic hub world and not something like this. There are like 5 characters you can unlock in this hub world, but it takes no effort. But other than those things I just mentioned, there isn't anything too bad or annoying about this game. They even added some nice quality of life improvements. Being able to access the shop anytime you want, being able to look at what you don't have in a level before even choosing what level you want to play, and being able to change your party of characters all with the buttons. The last one is a big one, because in every single game before this, I would have to always bring my attention to the bottom screen to change who I had in my party, and that got pretty annoying. Anyways, yeah, I really enjoyed this game. It was one of the easiest and quickest games to 100% complete, only taking me like 7 hours. I really would recommend this game to anyone who's a fan of LEGO games, and definitely to fans of Ninjago. This game will not disappoint. It's great to see these games get back into the swing of things again. Obviously, they're not completely the same as they once were, we are still getting objectives rather than mini kits, but that's okay. They continue to keep improving on each game, and honestly, I'm excited to see how they tackle the next game. LEGO Jurassic World is a game I don't really have any connection with. I played the console version when it came out, but I haven't played it since, and can't even remember how I felt about it. I always thought it was interesting because for most LEGO games, you're just beating up bad guys throughout the level. And in Jurassic Park movies, there isn't really a whole lot of combat from one I can remember. So it'll be interesting to see how they approach these levels. I'm assuming they'll have to be more puzzle based, which I'm fine with. I've never played a 3DS version before. So let's see how it holds up. Starting off in the first level, this game reminds me of a lot of LEGO Batman 3 with how close the camera is. But the levels are pretty fun in this game. In typical LEGO game fashion, this game relies on a lot of character switching, but this game relies on it a lot more than others I feel. Since this is based in a somewhat grounded universe, not every character is going to be able to jump super high or glide. Lots of characters have one or two specific abilities to them like being able to cut down ropes or charging up electrical panels. But something I find really interesting is this game takes a lot of abilities from classic LEGO games and shoves them into here. Like for example, female characters having a higher jump, some characters having the ability to scream, or small character doors. It's not a bad thing at all, it just shocked me to see another game where female characters have a higher jump, because it's such an old LEGO video game trope. But you will actually get into some combat scenarios, most of the time with tiny dinosaurs, but sometimes you're beating up other humans. The combat doesn't feel great in this game, which is fine because you're barely using it, Having the ability to fight in this game is simply huge so you can destroy objects for studs. The levels in this game are basically just one big set piece where you have objectives. These objectives could be feed the dinosaur, escape the dinosaurs, or just get to the end of the level. It's very simple, and the levels are really short but I kind of had a good time with them. The environments are all nice as well, but they do blend in a bit because most of them are just jungles. Other than normal levels, you have the typical vehicle or chase levels, and these are fine. I will say they only become really annoying when you want to get 100%. Speaking of 100%, going back and 100% completing the levels is pretty fun. Most of the objectives are just hidden collectibles like fossils or red bricks, so it really feels like they're just trying to get away from the objective gameplay formula, and thank god. I think my really big main complaint of the levels has to be the pacing of them. Them. They only give you 3 levels per story, but sure, each level is split up into 3 mini levels, but that doesn't really count. These stories will go by in a flash, and it just feels really weird. Like, in the first level, everyone is happy and excited about these parks, and then in the next, the dinosaurs are just outgoing crazy. I've only seen the first Jurassic Park and Jurassic World, so I'm not sure how poorly the other films are told, but yeah, it's just very jarring. Anyways, the levels are pretty simple in this game, but really enjoyable and bring me back to the classic and more simpler LEGO games. But thankfully this game has a hub world as well, and it's really cool. So the main hub world is just a discovery center from Jurassic World. You'll just find a shop and dino customizer in here. 
but each film also has its own mini hub world as well. There isn't any collectibles or anything in it, but it's super cool nonetheless. While playing through the story mode, you unlock more and more of it as well. The characters in this game are okay. Obviously, you have everyone from the Jurassic Park franchise, but you also have Jimmy Fallon for some reason. It's really odd. Why is Jimmy Fallon in this game? Was he in Jurassic World? I honestly can't remember that film, but it's Jimmy Fallon, so yeah. But by far, the best part about the characters has to be the ability to play as dinosaurs. In the normal levels, you can play as a lot of the smaller dinosaurs, but you can also unlock the dinosaur paddock. This gives you a pretty decently sized level where you can just free roam around as big or small dinosaurs. It's really cool. I love how your main objective here is to recreate a lot of the iconic death scenes in the films. But you can also create your own dinosaur in this game, which the customization for these is crazy. Loads of different colors, different scales and whatnot. It's so cool. But yeah, I don't have that much else to say about this game. It's definitely playing it really safe and it's very much just okay. But I did enjoy it. Just I feel like I won't remember much of this game in a month or so. I don't have that much to say about this game to be honest. It's a very basic Lego game. But I do kind of recommend it if you're just kind of bored. It's really, really simple. The simplest out of most of these Lego games but it's kind of addicting in a way. Well, since I don't have that much left to say about it, I think it's time to move on. LEGO Avengers is a game I'm not really a big fan of, at least the console version. I'm not an MCU fan, and every time I try to play this game, I stop after the first couple of levels, because the levels in this game are really boring and long. Eventually, I'll give that game my time, but the 3DS versions of the game, on the other hand, I have tons of memories playing this game. I remember I literally sold my copy of Super Smash Brothers on 3DS just to get this game. This game must have been really good to make 13 year old me sell Super Smash Brothers. So let's go see what all the hype is about. Starting up the game, we are put into the first level. Strangely enough, the first level is a retelling of the first scene in a second Avengers film. I guess it's so they can introduce you to all the Avengers and their unique abilities, but it still feels quite odd. Straight away, this game introduces you to combat, which feels amazing in this game. Performing combos of every character is satisfying, and even at the end of the combo, every character has their own unique finisher. Characters like Captain America can throw their shield or use it to deflect bullets right back at enemies. He also has this charge move, which instantly defeats enemies and breaks everything in your path. Even during his fighting animation, he'll throw his shield sometimes at random enemies. It's just so satisfying. Iron Man obviously has the ability to fly, but he also has new homing missiles. If you hold the attack button, it'll send rockets to everything on the screen which can be super overpowered. But the new main thing that sticks out with Iron Man has to be his suit switching ability. If you hold down the character swap button, a menu will appear that'll let you choose from loads of different Iron Man suits, some even granting you different abilities. This is extremely cool. I love watching the unique animations when he switches into certain suits. You also have characters of super speed as well, like Quicksilver. Almost all of these abilities will also be used for puzzle solving as well. A new feature is team up moves, which can help in combat and puzzle solving but I never really found myself using them unless I'm told to. But for the first time in any of these games, well, since LEGO Star Wars 2 on DS, on some levels you can have three characters with you at once. It makes things very chaotic, but it's pretty cool. The characters in this game are pretty cool. Nothing too shocking or exclusive about them, but there is a lot of variety. In most levels, you have a big party of characters with you. It's fun trying to solve puzzles using all the Avengers' unique abilities. A lot of the puzzles will be getting all the Avengers to one specific area using their different abilities. But speaking of levels, they are great in this game. For one, levels are finally long again. They're no longer splitting them up into three parts, which is great. Most levels in this game are decently long at times, and to be honest, none of the levels are way too long or way too short. They kind of hit that perfect balance. It also helps that the levels are so much fun in this game. Most of them are huge action set pieces where things are never really slowing down. Like the first level, you play as every Avenger in this cool snowy environment. Some of my favorite levels have to be the level where you're Captain America and Bucky on a train, the last level in the game where you get to play as all the Avengers and switch between them fighting endless hordes of enemies, but obviously the best level has to be the chase level. It starts off with Captain America fighting enemies on a moving vehicle, then transitions to the super cool driving section as Black Widow. Once Black Widow gets closer, she can shoot at Ultron. Then the level ends with this super cool section where you're playing as Quicksilver and have to save civilians from a derailed train. This level is so cool. So much is going on all in this one level and it's super fun. And this is just one example of how much variety these levels have. Most levels have multiple sections with different things to do in them and I'm so happy about it. It really feels like they're going back to the older level designs which I prefer so much more. In between the normal level design you'll have driving, flying, and boss fighting sections in them as well which makes them far more memorable. Getting 100% in the levels is pretty fun as well 
well. Although it's still objective based, but it gets the job done and honestly doesn't take long at all. Okay, so I know a lot of you guys are probably waiting for me to talk about this, but this game did something absolutely amazing. After you beat the first two levels, you're introduced to the hub world of this game. Oh my god, they brought back free roams, and not only that, it's Manhattan, and it feels just like the free roam in the console version of LEGO Marvel Super Heroes. This is amazing. What the hell, we haven't even had a free roam in so long, and when they finally bring them back, they go all out with it. This free roam is really similar to the one in LEGO Marvel Super Heroes. A lot of vehicles are the same, civilians walking around are the same, but there are a lot of little differences. For example, the X-Mansion is gone, now being in a place of Tony Stark's mansion, but this is absolutely insane. You can fly around the city as flying characters or use super speed. The controls feel great for what it is, and I can't even believe this is on a 3DS. The Hulk and most big figs can climb walls and super jump as well. They even have an extra that lets you super jump even higher, and it's insane how high you can go with this. That's three different ways to traverse this free roam without a vehicle. And mentioning vehicle, there are tons of driving and flying vehicles. The driving controls feel good. You can also use nitro on vehicles now, which is a nice feature. But the flying controls when it comes to vehicles are really bad. I'm not sure how to exactly explain it, but it feels very clunky. And while going straight, I'll accidentally keep turning. But I'm glad they're here nonetheless. Something that's also pretty cool is that you can spawn in these vehicles anytime you want. There is so much to do in this Vero. Lots of challenges, collectibles, and side quests. The challenges are pretty fun. There's only two of them you can do, racing or smashing challenge. Racing is, well racing. But the smash challenge, you have to go around the city destroying objects until you get a certain amount of studs. There are multiple of these challenges around the city. The collectibles are honestly really annoying to find. I have no clue how you would find most of these without a guide. There is an extra for collectible finder, but it only shows you where two of them are out of the 12 different things you'll be tasked to do. A lot of these are destroy a certain amount of different objects, find targets, or smash tin bugs on a wall. But these are all over the city. You also have the tiny collectibles like character tokens, which are basically impossible to find without a guide unless you're checking every single corner in this hub world. But honestly, these are pretty minor complaints. I do hate how they have a tracker, but it doesn't actually show you where everything is. But this is only a problem if you're going for 100%, and I'm sure if you spend time just messing around, you can probably find most of these. But the last thing you'll be tasked with in this hub world are side quests. To play any of these side quests, you first have to have the specific character. You get a small in-game cutscene before and after it. It's basically its own mini story mode within the city. These side quests are super cool. Most of the time, you'll just be chasing a bad guy, but there are some cool ones where you unlock new abilities, like Daredevils, for example. Once you complete all of them, you get the final side quest, where you play as every single character that you use in the other side quests to take down Modok. They did not need to have this mini little story mode outside of the main game, but yet they did, and I love this. It's super short and the side quests are really simple, but they already have so much other amazing stuff in this game and to be honest, this is what I expect from a LEGO game side quest. Not only do you get Manhattan if you're Roman, but you also get the Helicarrier, which yes, it does have the interior that looks almost identical to the one in LEGO Marvel Super Heroes you can also go inside Tony Stark's tower. Like, they could have only stuck with the big free roam they already made, but they gave us two more as well. And not only that, you get the option to play in daytime or nighttime in the main city. You could switch between these at any time. It doesn't change anything, and the other two free roams don't have a whole lot to do in them, but the fact that they have all this stuff in the first place is amazing. I think this game and LEGO Incredibles are the only two LEGO games where you can change between day or night. Like, I was happy of just having this city and all the stuff you could do in it, but this game just keeps on giving and I'm just shocked with the amount of effort that was put into the hub world. Also, I've yet to mention in between levels, the hub world will sometimes change depending on where you're at in the story mode, sometimes even being destroyed. Like you can't ever play in the destroyed city ever again after the level is complete. So they made that variation just to only be played once. Also the 100% reward in this game is pretty cool. You unlock the Hulkbuster and get to use it in the free roam. I'm glad they at least have something. And to be honest, getting 100% in this game was pretty easy but really fun. Oh, I love this game. Like, come on, this game is amazing. I am so happy with how odd quality this game is. It basically feels like an apology for how LEGO Marvel Super Heroes on a 3DS turned out. This game is genuinely amazing. The fact that all of this was done for the 3DS version is just mind-blowing. Like, just taking a look at LEGO Marvel Super Heroes and comparing it to this game is insane to think that those were both made for the same platform. It's interesting because LEGO Marvel Super Heroes is a game that was the turning point it kind of made all the other games very low quality after that. And now another LEGO Marvel game is here to reverse that. I loved this game as a kid and it holds a very special place in my heart. 
and I'm happy to finally be able to talk about it. I really recommend this game. It might just be the best LEGO game on the 3DS. Hell, the best LEGO game made for a portable console. But before I move on to the next game, there are some interesting things about it. For one, it for some reason never released on iOS and Android. I have no clue why, maybe it was too powerful for those consoles, but every single game since LEGO Batman 2 have been releasing on iOS and Android. And two, this is the first and only LEGO handheld game to get paid DLC. It released randomly after the launch of the game, and it was called the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. pack. This gave you 10 characters from the show. I've never watched the show, so I don't really have much to say about any of these characters, but the guy who drinks the potion is pretty cool because he's the only character in the game with these animations. But it's definitely not worth the money. You can't even buy it anymore because the eShop is now down, so rip. I do really recommend this game to literally anyone. It's super fun and impressive, but now we must sadly move on to the last LEGO game made for handhelds. LEGO Star Wars The Force Awakens is a game I barely remember. I got it for Christmas one year, but I don't actually remember playing the game so I don't have much to say about the console version. But I do remember playing the 3DS version on iOS when that came out. Well, kind of. You see, the iOS version lets you play the first level for free and nothing more, so that's all I experienced when it came to that version. I am not a huge fan of the Star Wars sequel trilogy, but who knows, I might end up really enjoying this game. So, I guess we should just get into it. Starting things off, this game drops you right into the hub world. As you can see, the camera is very close to your character like most of the previous games, but I'm just going to get this out of the way now. I do not like the camera position in this game, at least for the hub worlds. The camera is way too close to the character you're controlling, and for some reason, when you turn, the camera turns with you. It just feels really weird. Like, it's not the worst thing ever. It's just very odd when LEGO Avengers kind of perfected the controls, and now here they feel really, really janky. But since the first thing we see are the hub worlds, I guess I'll start out with that. I think they're mostly great in this game. You get four different planets to choose from, and they're decently sized. You'll mostly be navigating through them to get to the next mission, which can help with level progression, making it feel a lot better. There's also quite a bit to do in them. This time around, the approach is very similar to the console games. Go around looking for people that'll give you side quests or just collecting collectibles. The side quests can be loads of different things, like races, defeating a certain number of enemies, or finding an item for someone. They do have some unique ones, like the dancing one. But overall, yeah, they're fine. Like, they're not the most thrilling side quests in the world, but hey, they're honestly pretty similar to how the console game does their side quests. Collecting collectibles, on the other hand, is quite fun and addicting, like normal. They're not very hidden, to be honest, and because the camera is super close up, it can be very annoying to find some of these. You can also spawn vehicles in the hub world, but I never bothered. I definitely enjoyed exploring these hub worlds on foot more. It also didn't help that the controls weren't the best for vehicles. But hey, I'm glad they're here anyways. I think the settings in these hub worlds are great. They all stand out from one another, and some of them have interiors, like the Millennium Falcon or the Medical Bay. Exploring the Millennium Falcon by far has to be my favorite, despite it being so small. But that also reminds me, why can't you go inside the Millennium Falcon in the Skywalker Saga? But that's a whole other topic that I won't be getting into. I think the hub worlds are a great addition. They're all pretty high quality and can have a decent amount to do in them. The character customizer is even back after being gone since LEGO Marvel Super Heroes. Jesus, I did not realize these games haven't had a character customizer in that long. Speaking of characters, yeah, they're fine. I don't know, maybe it's because I'm not really into Star Wars these days, but the characters in this game are all kind of meh. Like, you can unlock so many past characters from previous Star Wars films, but almost every single Jedi has the same fighting animation. Like, this game has over 200 characters and might be the biggest on any LEGO handheld game, but how am I supposed to care when almost every single character feels exactly the same? Also, for some reason, young Leia has old Leia's face and it just looks so dumb. The whole character roster is now split up into dedicated classes, but it's more for looks rather than function because now I can't go page by page for the character roster because it'll just make me go to a whole new character class. It's not a huge issue, it just got pretty annoying. Most of the characters share the same abilities. You got the typical people with guns and lightsabers. The only really new thing I noticed was big figs. Unlocking a new character was never really exciting to me because most of the time they would just be some filler character that I have no clue they are and they'd also just not be unique at all. They all just kind of feel like skins of each other. The only time I was surprised by characters with Kylo Ren because he has this cool ability where he can stop bullets and shoot them back at enemies, but no, that was the only time. The combat in this game is okay. Fighting enemies feel fine, but it doesn't really feel like there's a difference between using a lightsaber or just normal fighting. You can use your blaster as well, but that's about it. Using the force on enemies can be fun though, like how Darth Vader can pull people towards them. There are some new things, like melee and shooting now being different buttons. 
and shooting sections. The melee and shooting being separate buttons got pretty annoying because a lot of characters will have an alternate throwable like a bomb or staff and I would always forget which one is dedicated to which button. But I do really like shooting sections. These will randomly happen on levels. You hide behind cover and shoot enemies. Once you defeat all the enemies, you can move on. They are kind of fun and they reward you with a lot of studs for not dying. But it is kind of weird how Jedi's can shoot like force balls. I'm not sure if that's in Star Wars canon. Boss fights in this game are really lame. Almost every single one of them are the same. Just dodge attack until you can do a quick time event. Rinse and repeat. But yeah, the combat and characters are honestly just really, really disappointing. Most characters feel the same and combat is really boring. So how are the levels? They're pretty fun, although for some reason they decided to split them up into three parts again. This wasn't needed at all, but oh well. The levels are all pretty long and they rely way too much on panels. Like there's so many pointless panels in this game when there could have been a puzzle or something far more interesting instead. They introduced these new multi-builds. Instead of just having to build a normal pile of bricks, that will build into the same thing every single time. Now you have multiple options to choose from. At first, I wasn't a fan of this. It just felt like padding out the game. But as it started to be utilized more into the puzzles, it kind of grew on me. When you have to build multiple things in a certain order to figure out a puzzle, it's really satisfying to build them in the right order the first time. But other than that, this LEGO game is pretty much the same as the rest. Although I wasn't a fan of this story and I thought the settings were kind of boring. Now when it comes to the completion for this game, obviously levels are still in the objective based format. Which is fine, just for some reason so many of these challenges would glitch out and take ages to reward me. There was this one where I had to deflect a bullet and hit a stormtrooper, but no matter how many times I did it, I would never get the gold brick. After like my 50th attempt, I just randomly got it. Not to mention you can't block in this game, so trying to deflect a bullet back is really annoying. It doesn't help you have 3 AI players that will constantly be attacking the enemies, lowering the chances of them actually shooting at you. This challenge wasn't the only one like this either. So many of them are just completely bugged and you have to keep trying them until you eventually get it. It got pretty annoying, and for some reason this glitch happened to me on some of the hardest challenges. Like this one where I can't take any damage while fighting Kylo or the spaceship one. The amount of times I replayed those missions despite clearly beating the challenges literally made me go insane. I would just never get the gold brick. Eventually I did beat all of them, but the glitch is just so random and happened way too often for a glitch like this. There honestly may be more challenges that are bugged like this, and I just might have gotten lucky. Other than the main levels, you do have spaceship levels, and I'm happy to say they are really good in this game. During the level, it'll go from an auto-scrolling section to one that gives you full control of the ship and then a cockpit perspective. The latter two being the best ones. Having full control of the ship was pretty cool and actually made spaceship levels a lot of fun. The cockpit sections are pretty cool as well. I do like how after you complete the main story, you unlock some bonus missions as well. One of them is the Battle of Endor. The next three are just some pretty dumb side stories with characters from The Force Awakens. Then the last one is some arena mode. You can barely call it an arena though because it's over within 5 minutes and it's not challenging at all. They have tons of traps everywhere but your enemies will never walk into them so it's pointless to even turn them on in the first place. But it was after this level I noticed something I've never seen before. This Lego game swears. Look, read it. That's one hell of a pilot. I don't think I've ever seen a Lego game with a swear word in it. So this really surprised me. But yeah, the levels in this game were fine. I think I enjoyed playing them in story mode, but because of the boring characters and annoying challenges, I didn't really enjoy playing them on free play all that much. Getting 100% in this game wasn't hard, it was mostly just annoying. Overall, I would say this game is just okay. Like, it added loads of new things and has cool things that are unique to it, but a lot of those things are just mediocre or okay. I do kind of recommend this game because it's pretty unique compared to all the other games. I just found it to be pretty boring. But before I stop talking about this game, there are some things I want to talk about on the iOS version. For starters, this version's free roam is in a whole new character perspective. You can't freely turn your camera, but I find this angle to be so much better. And your camera turning with you actually makes sense in this game and feels far more natural. But the main difference between the iOS version is it got DLC, four new character packs, but none of them are worth that at all. None of the characters are unique. Hell, they couldn't even give Darth Maul his lightsaber. It's so weird that this game is still available on iOS. I could even go back and look at all the achievements I got when this game first released. But the weirdest thing to me is that I got all DLC in this game for free. Like, I've never spent any money on this game before. I was just trying to find the prices for everything, but I couldn't even find where you purchase any of the content. So I pressed the restore purchase button and it just gave me everything for free. I'm not sure if this is a bug, but I swear I've never spent money on this game in my life. But if you've wanted to play this game and don't have a 3DS, I would recommend the iOS version. It's probably pretty cheap to purchase all the DLC in this game. You get extra characters and a better camera in the hub worlds. 
but do I recommend this game in general? Yes, it has a lot of unique things about it. I just found the game to be pretty boring, but I think if you're a LEGO video game fan, you'll get some enjoyment out of it. Well, that's it. Over the span of 5 months and 5 videos, I have 100% completed every single LEGO handheld game, at least the more traditional ones. That is 22 games, and honestly, I really enjoyed this journey. But before I wrap things up, I think I should give a proper ranking of every single game, because it has been highly requested. So here it is. Cam Review's Official LEGO Handheld Game Ranking Starting at the bottom of the list, we have LEGO Marvel Super Heroes. It's pretty obvious why this is at the bottom. It completely changed the LEGO game formula for the worse, and not only that, it caused a lot of future games to follow the same path because of it. They didn't change the formula because they thought it was a good idea, they did it because they wanted to appeal to a totally different market, and just left their current fanbase behind. It's hard for me to say this game is completely awful though, it's honestly just different and that's okay. But for me, it's hard for me to move on past this game, and what it did to all the future LEGO handheld games. So that's why it'll probably always be at the bottom of the list. In the 21st place, we have LEGO Ninjago and Androids. Yeah, I'm surprised too, I didn't expect to hate this game so much, but here we are. This game just had some of the worst levels and decisions I have ever seen in a LEGO game before. What annoyed me the most is that before this game released, these games were actually getting better. But as soon as this one released, all of a sudden it goes back to the same formula as LEGO Marvel Super Heroes. It kind of makes me wonder what even happened. LEGO The Hobbit had pretty decent levels and got rid of the annoying objectives. But for some reason, this game just brought them back, and a lot of other annoying stuff like Marvel Super Heroes did poorly. Just thinking about playing this game makes me feel sad, and I don't ever want to think about it again. In 20th place, we have LEGO Harry Potter Years 1 through 4. I was surprised to hear after I talked about this game in a previous video that a lot of people like this game, and I have no problem with that at all. This game is very unique, and it kind of keeps the same charm that other LEGO games have. But with how messy the controls are and the very boring levels, I really did not like this game. I felt like half the time I was reading text or matching patterns. I do like how it's based more off the books rather than the films, but only a Harry Potter mega fan would have noticed that, and I am not one of those. If you like this game, I'm glad you can enjoy it. But personally, I just don't think it's for me. In the 19th spot, we have the LEGO Movie Video Game. I thought this game was a step in the right direction after LEGO Marvel Super Heroes. But that's simply all it was. The levels are fine, but mostly this game is just so forgettable. This game doesn't mean much to me, other than it's the game that released after like Marvel Super Heroes, and was kinda better, but barely, so I don't have a whole lot to say about it. In 18th place, we have like The Hobbit. Yet again, this game is trying to fix all the things that went wrong in like Marvel Super Heroes. But at least in this game, there are some signs of well, I want to say innovation. I enjoyed the levels a lot in this game, but it's more about doing objectives than finding collectibles, and that goddamn world map is one of the weirdest and most annoying things I've had to navigate in any game I've played. I think this game is fine, but sadly, it's still in the same style as LEGO Marvel Super Heroes, so I don't really ever see myself playing this game again. In 17th place, we have LEGO Jurassic World. I don't know why, but I find this game so damn forgettable. The story is a mess, since each film only gets three levels based off it. The characters are all lame as hell. Again, why is Jimmy Fallon in this game? And I'm sorry, but with these more objective-based LEGO games, I'm always going to just like them a lot less when compared to more traditional LEGO games. This game is far better than the games I've mentioned before it, but it also is so meh at the same time. I just prefer my LEGO games with huge levels that you can go back and explore to find secrets and collectibles. And with the checklist-style mission structure, it just defeats the whole purpose of a LEGO game and just feels really lazy. Like, instead of making the levels bigger with loads of secrets, instead they can make it shorter and give you a checklist of what to do and copy and paste it throughout every single level. This problem isn't only with Jurassic World, but with every LEGO game that is structured this way. Some people might like this style, but I'm not a fan of it at all. Next up in 16th place, we have LEGO Harry Potter Years 5-7. through seven. This game is fine, just the story mode is over in like 2 hours, and for some reason the levels are structured very weirdly. Like you'll start off in a room, finish the task in that one room, and then you have to teleport to the next section of that level. It also doesn't help that every time you are teleported, you have to sit through two whole loading screens. I think mechanically, everything feels great, and it's everything I wanted from a LEGO Harry Potter game on the 3DS, but the levels just ruin the whole experience for me. Next up, in 15th place, we have LEGO Batman 3. Basically, all the same issues that I had with LEGO Jurassic World plagued this game too. But it is higher because the missions are far better and the combat is super fun. I think the suit mechanics in this game are kind of lame and makes it completely pointless to want to unlock more characters. It's a good LEGO Batman game, but by far my least favorite out of the three. In 14th place, we have LEGO Star Wars 2. Okay, I know on the first video I ever uploaded to this channel, I was super hard on this game, but it actually did a lot right for how buggy it was. 
For starters, it was nothing like the GBA ports. I've heard nothing but awful things about those games. The graphics are super impressive, and it looks a lot better than a lot of the LEGO games developed by TT Fusion released for the DS. The levels are super ambitious and unique, even if that does mean they run awfully, it's pretty cool. But overall, this game is just a very confusing and buggy mess. Which really stinks, because the game starts out great in the fourth film, but as things go on, you see the levels decline in quality fast. There are a lot of unique things in this game that you'll never see in any other LEGO game, like the character customization anywhere you are, the battle mode and sandbox mode, mode, and the weirdly inappropriate jokes found while playing through the free play mode. As buggy and genuinely not good this game is, I actually would recommend it. And I look back at my first review on this channel and cringe at a lot of the stuff I said about it. It's not amazing by any means, but it sure as hell will entertain you. And I can't say that for a lot of the other LEGO games after its release. In 13th place, we have LEGO Pirates of the Caribbean. I like this game a lot, and it holds a special place in my heart. The levels are great recreations of the console versions, and although that makes it stand out a whole lot less, I really like like this game. It's pretty short and easy to get 100%, but that makes it a great game to just pop in and play. I don't have loads to say about this game, but I would recommend it. Next in 12th place, we have LEGO Star Wars 3. This was the first game released for the Nintendo 3DS, and it's pretty great. Very impressive spaceship sections and just overall massive filling levels. This game doesn't disappoint. I would say the combat did get a bit weird during this game, and it kind of affected all the other games after it. But again, this is a short game to just pop in and play. I had a good time with this game as a kid, and even now. It's really short as well, making it super easy to come back to. But to be honest, this game and Pirates of the Caribbean are pretty interchangeable for me since my feelings for those games are pretty much the same. In 11th place, we have LEGO like, Star Wars The Force Awakens. I may have been harsh on this game earlier, and for most of these games for that matter, but this game has a lot of unique things in it. Having four different hub worlds and lots of puzzles, it's pretty great. I just found this game to be pretty uninteresting, and the characters are some of the laziest I've ever seen. The fact that the DLC characters aren't even unique just really annoys me. I think most people would have a good time with this game though, but for me, I'm just not a fan of this film in general, and it's just another objective based game. You already know how I feel about that. In 10th place, I know this is going to make a lot of people mad, but it's LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga. It is the first ever LEGO game by TT Fusion for the Nintendo DS. I think it's a great game, but it does have some pretty annoying issues, mostly to do with how annoying it is to 100% complete this game. You have to do some really challenging mini games, and you can't stack multipliers. But even without those issues, I just find the levels in this game to be pretty boring. But at the end of the day, I can't hate this game. It's a pretty great game if you're not going for 100%, and it was the first game I ever got of my first 3DS on Christmas. Also, the fact that you can play the whole game multiplayer is insane. I really do recommend this game. In 9th place, we have LEGO Ninjago Shadows of Ronin. The missions in this game are a lot of fun, and it feels like you're playing through an episode of the TV show. It would probably be higher if it wasn't for the weird hub world, and it has the objective-based gameplay again. I don't have loads to say about this game, but it's a pretty good Ninjago game. Next in 8th place, we have LEGO Chimo of Alice Journey. This this game is mainly so high because of how impressive the hub world is. To be fair, I think the levels in this game are poorly designed and I don't like the combat. Now that I'm thinking about it, yeah this game is way too high up on the list, I hated the levels in this game. I'm going to move it in between LEGO Star Wars The Force Awakens and The Complete Saga, so it is now in 10th place, putting The Complete Saga in 9th and Shadows of Ronin in 8th. So let's move on to number 7 which is LEGO Lord of the Rings. I like this game a lot. The hub world is absolutely massive and helps this game feel like an adventure. The levels in this game are all fun and well designed, and the characters are super unique. What more could you ask for in a LEGO game? I do have to go out of my way and say I'm talking about the 3DS slash Vita version of this game and not the DS version, but I do highly recommend this game. The whole story mode has multiplayer, it's insane. In 6th place, we have LEGO Batman 2. Oh, the memories of this game. Not only does this game have so many memorable levels, but the character roster is so good. It was the first LEGO game to introduce flying and super speed, and so many new abilities that are used so often in LEGO games today. Nostalgia may be pushing this game further up on the list than what it should be. I genuinely think it's a really fun game. It's super short, so it makes it super easy to just chill and play, and the whole game is multiplayer as well. I don't really know how you could go wrong with this game. We are now in the top 5, and just remember this is my opinion, and at the end of the day, we all have different tastes and needs, but in 5th place is LEGO City Undercover. I was never able to play the console version of this game growing up and still haven't gotten around to doing it, but this game basically gave that to me as a kid. You have a massive city to free your home in, tons of cars to drive around, lots of collectibles that are addicting to collect, and a great story mode. I love how everything just works in this game and makes this one of the best LEGO games, hell, one of the best games on the 3DS. It pushed the 3DS to its limits and it still impresses me so much today. I highly recommend this game if you haven't gotten around to playing it. In 4th place, we have LEGO Indiana Jones 2. I really enjoyed my time with this game when I came 
going back to it. I don't have loads of memories of this game as a kid, which made it more shocking how much it surprised me. This game is a lot better than the console version. The levels are all super long and have tons of collectibles and puzzles. As some of my favorite levels out of any LEGO handheld game, there's also this pretty big free roam that's fun to explore. Overall, there's a lot to love in this game, and it was cool seeing TT Fusion doing what they want rather than just trying to copy the console version. I do recommend this game. Obviously, it's in my top 5. Next and third place is LEGO Adventures. This game shocked me. Sure, it's an objective based game, but I can get past that because of the massive free roam. This game is one of the games that helped me get back into LEGO games, and I'll never forget all the memories and fun I had playing this game then and even today. It's a damn impressive game, and is always my go-to pick when recommending a LEGO game for the 3DS or Vita. It showed what the developers were capable of doing, and I'm glad they got some kind of redemption after how poorly LEGO Marvel Super Heroes was received. Okay, so this was pretty hard for me to do, but in second place is LEGO Batman. This game and the game after it are honestly pretty interchangeable to me. It's hard for me to decide which one is better because I love them both the same. But this game is just overall a fantastic game. It has an amazing atmosphere, great levels, and tons of super cool characters. This game gave me hours of enjoyment as a kid, and I'll never forget that. I can always just come back to this game and have a fun time. And the same can be said about the game in first place. Finally, my favorite LEGO handheld game of all time is LEGO Indiana Jones. This game is just fantastic. Some of my favorite levels of any LEGO handheld game are in this game. I had a really fun time replaying this game and have tons of memories playing it. But yeah, that is all 22 traditional LEGO games 100% completed, reviewed, and ranked. And wow, what a weird journey it has been. I am so happy I got to shed some light on these games and find tons of other people who also played these games growing up. It really does suck that it has to end, and it's sad knowing we'll probably never see a LEGO game designed differently for a different console. Technology has gotten to the point where most console experiences can be played anywhere now, making portable gaming and just normal gaming almost the same thing. These games will never be ported anywhere, and with the Nintendo eShop now gone, the only way to play this game is via emulation, owning a copy, or owning a Mono 3DS. It's sad knowing that the kids growing up today will never get to experience what true portable gaming is, and in some way it makes me feel envious that they get to play the console version of LEGO Batman anywhere they want on their Steam Deck. But I'm sure people who grew up with a Game Boy felt the same way when they grew up and kids my age were playing the DS and 3DS. But that's just the way it is. These games provided me with tons of enjoyment that I will never forget. And I just want to thank everyone at TT Fusion for releasing such high quality games for the portable systems. Especially because most of the time game devs just use it as a way to make a quick buck. Although it's been a very rocky road, something I find most interesting is that a lot of the later LEGO portable games would actually influence the Skywalker Saga. You know, short levels, having objectives to do rather than finding collectibles, and making a lot of the characters not unique. This video is not about the Skywalker Saga, so I'll just have to save my complaints about that game for another time. Before you comment asking about LEGO Friends, the RTS games, or GBA games, I am getting to them. They'll all be in their own video, I just wanted to focus on more traditional LEGO games. A lot of those games are very different from the typical LEGO games. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this series. Thank you so much for watching to the end, and trust me, I got big things planned for the future, so subscribe if you're interested. Thank you for watching.